gorgeous family. Um, Dr. Scott is the um, planting and lead pastor of Harvest Point Fellowship Church. His ministry experience spans many years serving in various positions within the local church. He believes that the church should be culturally relevant while maintaining biblical integrity. A man who values family, Lawrence is a devoted husband and father. He is married to the love of his life, the beautiful and gifted Shannon Scott. They have six children, Kaylin, Leah, Eden, Lawrence III, Zachary, and Reagan. Both Dr. Scott and his wife are passionate about helping people discover their God-given purpose. Lawrence earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy with a minor in business administration from the University of Houston and a Master of Theology degree and a Doctor of Ministry degree in leadership from Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. So please welcome Dr. Scott. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, for that gracious uh, introduction. At the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that I was an expert in this and I am not, um, but I do thank you for the opportunity to have a conversation regarding um, reconciliation, racial reconciliation. And so we have a few slides that we'll, we'll kind of work through. And let me kind of preface before we get going. Uh, I may speak in general terms. I may say black, white, black this, white that. I recognize this conversation is not binary by any stretch, but often it is framed that way. And we know it's not binary, especially when you consider uh, some of the uh, things that's happening right now with our Asian brothers and sisters that we are praying for. So uh, as I talk through this, no offense if I speak in general terms, but I hope hopefully uh, I can make a point as we press on. Is that all right? All right, so <clears throat> as we talk about reconciliation, first slide, I wanna talk about uh, what we need to recognize before we reconcile, right? One of the things that we found out that we already know, but was right in front of us, myself and a few other pastors in the city, uh, Pastor Blake Wilson, who's here uh, in the conversation today, uh, Pastor Jason Shepard, uh, who's out in the Woodlands uh, Church Project, and then also Steve Besner, uh, Houston's Northwest. We came together uh, in the fall of last year um, we had already been working together to put together a sermon series where we could go around, uh, pastors around the city can come together and preach on a biblical perspective of race. We had a few panels, talked to a number of pastors and small cohorts, had large gatherings of pastors at different churches. And one of the things that kept showing up in the conversation as we, we, we engaged in this dialogue was um, you know, discussing what we were actually trying to reconcile, right? Because uh, I think if we don't fully understand what we're reconciling, then our attempt at reconciliation may not produce the fruit that we are looking for. Um, that picture earlier that you all saw, my wife and my kids, uh, my wife and I have been married almost 16 years. I'm excited about that. And here's what I know about marriage and any relationship, you know this, that if you want to reconcile, because uh, over years, there are moments of disagreement, amen, hallelujah, somebody, there are moments of disagreement, and you know that if there's going to be reconciliation, you just can't run past the issue. I can't say to my wife, if we're arguing about something or disagreeing, I don't want to say argue, but disagreeing about something, hey, let's just forget about it and go out to eat. Eventually, I have to, to deal with it. I can't just move to celebration without dealing with the issue. And sometimes in this conversation of reconciliation, we rush to celebration. Now, let me be clear. Uh, those moments of uh, panels of racial conversation, the foot washing and whatever else, all those things are great. Those are celebratory moments. They are just a moment. That in itself cannot help us uh, in the conversation of rec uh, racial reconciliation. And often that's what we do. Something happens in our culture and then we rush to a moment of celebration or a moment of healing. And li listen to this. I don't want to minimize the impact of those events. I'm simply saying those are not enough, right? You have to deal with the issue. So before we talk about what we need to recognize, I wanna talk about reconciliation from a biblical per, uh, perspective. And of course you can find this in scripture as we talk about being reconciled to God. Before we talk about us being reconciled to one another, we take priority of being reconciled to God because only by uh, us understanding our reconciliation to God can we understand reconciliation to each other. Scripture says, Romans 5.10, for if we were enemies, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Few observations from that passage. God is 
the reconciler, right? So even as we engage in dialogue about interpersonal relationships, we recognize that God initiates this and God is the reconciler. And the second thing is that we are reconciled to him, right? That's a priority for us. As we look at Romans 5, 10, we are restored from this place of being an enemy to those who shall be saved. And so the beautiful part about our relationship with the Lord is that we there is a transfer. We're no longer in this enemy spot. We have been transferred or restored to this position uh, as those who will be saved. In Genesis 1, 2, you would remember there's harmony in the scripture. Genesis 3, uh, things break up. The relationship is broken. But we are, last point, reconciled through Jesus. So we see that God is the reconciler. We're reconciled to him through Jesus. Next slide. Uh, talking about reconciled to one another. Uh, for he himself, Ephesians 2, 14, 16, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing his flesh, the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, here it is, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. Now, let me say this. Uh, normally, this is a reference passage um, to talk about reconciliation, because there is a beautiful picture of reconciliation between Jew and Gentile, right? And often when we frame this conversation with just this verse, we, we have a habit of making, and here's those general terms, um, white people, this group, and black people, this group being reconciled. In reality, for us, it's really Gentile on Gentile kind of stuff. But the point is this, the reconciliation that happens between the Jew and Gentile reminds us that there is a reconciliation that can happen with any other schism that exists. That is, that those of us who are called by the Lord, who love the Lord, believe in him by faith, we recognize that because we have been reconciled to him, because he has broken down the dividing wall, there can be reconciliation with uh, when there is uh, a disagreement in any form whether it be racially or otherwise, right? So some observations from the passage, and of course, you who read the scripture recognize there's so much more to say about this passage. But we have recognized that uh, destroying the enemy was to reconcile both Jewish and Gentile believers to himself, uh, created in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And here it is again, this implies reconciliation with one another in all schisms of human life. Because the Lord is a reconciling God, whatever division we have, it can be overcome through the, through the gospel, through Jesus Christ, right? And so we see this in the scripture, and we can see this play out in our own lives. Of course, we can also talk about uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, this ministry of reconciliation that we have been given that prioritizes us being instruments by which we bring the gospel to others that they may find reconciliation with the Lord. And so here we have a picture first of us being reconciled to God. And then we see this picture that necessarily because of our relationship, reconciliation is available between us. So there's vertical and horizontal and it can overcome any schism that we experience. Right now we're talking about issues with race. Okay, next slide. Uh, a book, uh, a quote from Tony Evans, one is Embrace, great book. He says, this, the purpose of reconciliation goes further than merely being able to articulate that we are one. Reconciliation is not an end in itself. It is a means towards the greater end of bringing glory to God through seeking to advance his kingdom in a lost world. Our ability to be reconciled is a witness to the world. And when we are not able uh, to rec uh, rec uh, rec uh, reconcile, then it also says something to those who are watching the church. Who, then they say, listen, if they can't get it together themselves, then what good is this gospel that they preach? And so we have an opportunity to remember that reconciliation is, is bigger than just talking about reconciliation, that there is an, a greater uh, goal uh, in front of us. Next slide. Okay. Here it is, okay? So uh, what I just stated, all of us know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to believe that, but we had to start there, right? For us in a very practical way though, to reconcile, we must recognize the issue that divides. 
Okay, we know we've been reconciled to God. We know that because of Jesus, the dividing wall is broken and any schism, any issue, anything that divides us, we can overcome that because we've already been reconciled. Now, when we are disobedient and we're not walking in the spirit, we go against that. But any schism can be defeated when we know what we have in Jesus. Next slide. Here's the issue. So we're doing this uh, preaching series. Some of us did four parts. I think Pastor Blake, he might have spent eight weeks in it. Uh, a couple of folks did two weeks. Some people tried to start the series, had to shut it down because so much tension around this conversation of race. And I'm talking about the church, right? And one of the biggest issues when it comes to reconciliation often is what we're talking about. In fact, if you go back to George Floyd, right? A moment where most people uh, were willing to say, even if they said, you know, racism is not a big thing, most people in that moment were able to recognize an event, right? They, they were able to say, you know what, that guy, that situation, that wasn't right. It could possibly be racially motivated. Most people said that. And even in that crowd of people who said that, here's the distinction. Some said, look at that event that was unfortunate. Others said, this is a part of a system of activity towards a group of people. So here it is. How do those two people who both look at that same event and have empathy and care reconcile if we're looking at, on one hand, as the slide shows, this individual interpersonal act of discrimination or racism, and then on the other side, a systemic issue. See here, here's where it gets interesting because in our conversations of reconciliation, when we do our feet washing and the racial reconciliation panel, we high five and we go back home for because that, uh, uh, an event just happened. But when you're dealing with a systemic issue, that event is not enough. And this is the disagreement, right? And many of the pastors that I talk to, um, they land in either place, right? Um, it's either an event or it's a systemic thing, okay? And as I press through this, and let me, let me define it as I lay, lay it out here, systems and structures that have procedures or processes that disadvantage a group of people. Now, I'm gonna say this plainly, and, and again, not every, as I talk white and black, folks are not a monolith, people will disagree, but for the most part, for the most part, if I'm talking to an African-American pastor, me having conversations about systemic issues, there's, there's no pushback because it's a part of the experience. That's not always the case in other groups. And so as we talk about racial reconciliation, as we talk about people that we serve at these schools, when we engage people of a different uh, ethnic group, we have to ask ourselves, what is the issue that we're willing to deal, dealing with? Are we simply talking about an individual act that occurs every now and then sporadically, or are we talking about a system? Now, for some of us on this line, this is old news for you. Right, but often this is a place of disagreement. So I wanna take a moment and look at some scripture. If we can flip over to the ne uh, next slide. I wanna look at Exodus chapter one real quick. I have a few minutes here and talk about a system and then talk about how that is applicable to us and then what we do after that. In Exodus, it's not listed here, but I'll read it. Chapter one, starting at verse eight. It says this, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more mighty than we are. They're more and they're more mighty than we are. And so here you have a picture where a king who did not know Joseph, did not know that history is in position. There's a particular group of people, the Jews in this case, who he says they're stronger than us. There's more of them than us. And so he's creating what will be his agenda. Right, because in order to create a system, you have to have policy. So here the king is bringing forth an issue with a particular group of people. Let me be clear. In the scripture, uh, there is no uh, conversation um, about race like it is for us. Race is a social construct, right? So when we talk scripture, we're talking about nations, um, places of origin, and that's how people uh, move through the scripture. We have created race um, in order to oppress groups of people, but in the scripture, uh, it, it is dealing with a nation. But this system and pathway applies in the race, racism situation. So you have this king and he, he, he makes an issue uh, with the Jews. He says this in verse uh, 10. Come, let us deal wisely with them or else they will multiply. Listen to this. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves 
to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. A few things. So this king in Egypt is like, okay, listen, y'all. These folks of Israel, too many. They're going to be a problem. The next statement he makes is, he makes the point that they're not patriots. He says that they're going to fight against us. If something goes down, they're not going to roll with this nation. They're going to fight against us. They are an enemy of us who have patriotism. And then he says, they're going to depart from the land. Now, here's the issue. If you think a group of people are bad or not for you, and they may depart from the land, you ought to be excited. You ought to be excited that they're leaving. The only reason why you would not be excited is if you needed to maintain them there in order to benefit your nation. And so for the Pharaoh, he needed to maintain uh, the Israelite presence as an economic asset without jeopardizing their security. We together? So we're talking about right now about building a system. For folks who say, I don't get the systemic stuff, I'm, we're going to help you today. Okay? So you have an agenda. These folks, too many of them, they're a problem. They're not patriots. They're going to go against us, but we need them to prosper. We need them to keep them here. The Bible says, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Now, this is how you create a system. You put forth policy, and then you get people to carry out the policy. Taskmasters, right? I'm in Exodus chapter 1. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom, and Ramses. Watch this verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, the more they spread out, so that they were dread. So they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel, Israel to labor rigorously. Right? Verse, skip down to verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives one of whom was named Shifra and the other who was named Pua. Okay, here's the picture. I got policy. I'm the king. All it takes is a person to put forth policy. We're talking about a system. Brings the policy, makes it national agenda. Okay, now that it's agenda, we got to carry it out. Taskmasters, hard labor. I can't just use taskmasters. This is systemic stuff. Let me go get the midwives, right? The Bible mentions these two midwives by name. You know the story. The Bible says that this man, verse 16, he said to them, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. This is national policy. This is not just a conversation. This is how we get down. This is our system. This is our system. But this is what verse 17 helps us. And this is what's going to help us today. It says this, but the midwives fear God. Um, if I was in church, somebody would say amen right there. Purvis, that's for you right there. The amen goes right there. Amen. That, that's a good word. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. Hear this. There is a system that is in place. But these two midwives said, I will not participate in the system. This helps us because sometimes when people hear systemic racism, they feel like that says that everybody in the system is racist. And they, they take offense because you say, I'm not racist. Systemic racism doesn't require everybody to be racist. That, that's the point. It's, it's a system. You can participate in the system and reject the part, parts of that system that bring forth oppression and other systemic issues. They, they rejected it because they feared the Lord. They feared God. I'm not doing it. And here's the beautiful part for us today. We have to be like them. See, when we argue whether or not there's systemic issues, we're way, I believe we're spending a lot of energy in spaces we don't need to. If we're going to be, if we need to, if we're going to be honest about this, you know, America, many benefits as there are, the history has policy and people who have perpetuated these things. And watch this. When you have a system that was built on this, then unless you repair the system and the people, it's going to perpetuate some stuff. That means in 2021, when someone says there are no overt laws that are against people of color or something like that, it doesn't have to be, right? Like for you all who serve schools, you know the disparities in some of these schools. And you say, wait, it's the tax dollars that, that pay for the schools. You know those communities didn't build themselves, right? And so when we have conversations about racial reconciliation, 
we have to consider, do, uh, is it possible for a system to be created? Absolutely. Is it possible to be in that system and reject it? Absolutely. But that's what you have to do. Don't argue whether or not um, is it an individual act or a systemic act. Uh, the answer, ma'am, sir, is yes, uh, there exists both, right? There are moments where there are individual acts, and then obviously we're, we're dealing with the system. And so for us, when we think about an example like Exodus 1, and we think about our own um, environment and community, what do we do with this reality, right? Because for some, it's overwhelming. Well, what can I do in one person? It's a system, then what you want me to do? Like change the laws or something. What, what do you want me to do? Like ne uh, Next slide. This is it. Be empathetic towards those who experience individual acts of discrimination. And that's a beautiful conjunction, by the way, not or. And advocate for systemic change. Here's the thing, right? If you take a classroom of 30 students and a teacher, and one student in that room of 30 is a bully, just one bullies one kid and those 30 students see this guy bully that one kid and never say a thing never tell the teacher the teacher sees it never says anything it doesn't take a room full of bullies to create a system or an environment where bullies can excel all it takes is 29 students or 28 students say nothing and the teacher to turn the other direction. And that's what happens sometimes when it comes to this racial conversation. People say, listen, I'm not a racist. And I know you're not. Amen. God bless you. But do we participate in a system that makes it easy for racism to thrive? The question is not whether or not that's an individual act or is it a system? The reality is it's both. And when we engage people, whether it's in schools or otherwise, if we come with that in mind, it shows up in the way that we serve folks. There's a certain amount of empathy that, that shows up. We are less critical about things, right? And we avail ourselves to serve in a way that I believe God gets the glory because when we can reconcile each other, uh, it's a witness to the world to help them see the God that, ha that we have been reconciled to. That's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that was so helpful, um, Dr. Scott. I, I do want to also mention that, um, as, as I talked about before, we are asking um, our churches to move along this continuum of relief, reconciliation, and development. And so um, for those of you that may be joined in a little bit after I said that, I just wanted to reiterate that that is why this conversation is important, because as Loving Houston, we are partnering our churches with schools and we want um, to equip you to be the healthiest partners uh, for the families that are in the schools that you're serving. And so um, we can't not say anything. I love the example of the bully in the classroom. Um, and so I think that that is fantastic, especially as you guys as believers are going out into um, these schools and are going to be on school campuses, if you see any, anything like this happening, if you see people being mistreated, then um, saying something, advocating for change. So I really appreciate that. Um, I know you got several amens. I know it was pretty quiet, Dr. Scott, but you did get several amens in the chat. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, Mel, were there any questions that came up? Not yet, but if you have questions now feel free to put them in the chat um yeah we want to keep the conversation going and i know it's a, a heavier topic for some and requires some some wrestling and some real honesty with ourselves and where our ministries are uh, but this is a safe space for us to process and learn together so we encourage you to ask questions uh, or to give your thoughts as well Great to be here. Wow, all I can say is <laughs> amen and amen. Um, so I, I was curious if what, I, I just want confirmation on what I was hearing is that, um, because in light of uh, a statement that came out this week in our denomination, which suggested that, um, when one chooses not to participate in anti-racist uh, action and or initiative, 
um, then there, that default is participation in racism. Uh, simply by not participating, we are participating in racism. Is that what I am hearing? Um, so I, th I, I think I'm aware of where that came from and, and the conversation on being anti-racist. Um, there are a few books on that. And so I don't want to um, say that everyone knows what that looks like walking out. Well, here's what I will say, um, that we have a responsibility as believers um, in this place of reconciliation to be intentional um, and if a person is willing to not be intentional, so for sometimes, sometimes you're just unaware. Like I, in, in this conversation, some people just don't know, right? So if you're not aware, then that's one thing. But if you're being intentional to avoid um, walking in the spirit in that space to, to be a help, then you're, you are being intentional to do something. And in that case, you are being intentional not to be a solution or a help um, to this conversation on race. So I don't want to sign that statement. Um, I get where you're going with that. But I would just say some people are just ignorant. Others are intentional not to uh, involve themselves, kind of like the bully in the classroom. And in that case, you are, uh, I would say, probably part of uh, the issue. That answered it well. Thank you. Yes, well said. We yeah. had a question come in the chat, a couple questions. Um, one from Mary Carol and Thanks for joining us, Mary Carol. What would be the best way to bring others along in our volunteer groups to understanding this? And I think when she's saying volunteer groups, you're thinking church volunteers, especially the volunteers that we're sending into public schools. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Scott? Yeah, so, um, and I, to be clear, this is a volunteer group at the church, right? Or uh, with the school? At the church, going to the school. Going to the school. Um, I think it's always good to start scripture. First of all, whenever I, you know, we deal with uh, conversation on racism, we try to be biblical, um, historical, factual, and those things overlap, of course, but there are facts that exi exist and not in the scripture and, and so forth. Um, but I like starting with scripture. I think the story in Exodus is helpful because um, when you start with those two midwives, it, it's freeing to know, hey, I'm, you know, you, you, a lot of times in this country, I've, I've seen that people just feel, you know, depending on the context, you're attacking, uh, you're saying that I'm this. So depending on the context, I like to disarm with a passage like that. Um, but again, starting with scripture, you know, because again, I, even though there is no uh, race, racism is a social construct, th this idea of oppressing a group is shown in the scripture. And you can also see throughout the scripture how the Lord deals with it, whether you're in the book of Isaiah, Micah, Proverbs, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, so I start with the scripture in love. And depending on the context, you, you kind of determine where to start in order to disarm folks so they can see themselves as those who are part of the solution and not lumped in a group of folks who automatically are racist or something like that. Yes, thank you, Dr. Scott. And I will also add that Loving Houston has a... a resource website. Um, I think I think one of the first steps too is learning uh, what's out there and not inventing the wheel, but um, leveraging those resources. So I'll post that link in the in the chat as well. Um, and thank you, Renee, for sharing about the Fort Bend Interfaith Communities Loving Your Neighbor Anti-Racism Prayer Vigil this Sunday at 7 p.m. in Sherland Town Square. So if you're in the Fort Bend area, that could be a great thing to show up to and show solidarity and, and hear from, from others about. Um, any other questions? This is probably better for a sidebar conversation too, but um, it's something that we've been trying to address and make sense of where um, a lot of the disproportionality in the foster care system within our work and the child welfare system, I would love to have additional conversations about um, there's a lot of people trying to address it, but we're not really getting anywhere and the statistics are terrible here in Houston. And yep. so I, I would love some, just some help in making sense of some of that and learning from you guys. So um, yeah, that, there's probably not much you can speak to that in this forum, but, um, and I don't want to derail the conversation in a different direction, but um, we, I'd love that, that to be um, something that we move forward with. Oh yeah, that'd be great. 
I wish we had a time had time to talk to that. But yeah, I love to talk to you offline. Great. Thank you, Amber. And yeah, Marilyn, our, our wonderful executive director, she's always thinking about how what we talk about applies directly to our church school partnerships. So I know that several of you on the call are overseeing your church school partnership. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think what Dr. Scott talked about looks like in our church school partnerships? How can we help our church volunteers, for example, be more empathetic? How do we help our church advocate for systemic change? Mm -hmm. Let's hear from some of you on the ground and in the churches. And of course, Dr. Scott, if you have practical ideas, <laughs> we'd love to hear from you as well. And district coordinators, y'all chip in too. Dr. Scott, you mentioned um, that, uh, early on in your uh, talk about having a group of other, you yourself and a group of other pastors were thinking of sort of like doing the circuit going around and because it seems to me that education, you know, these kind of educational events like this are absolutely vital and, you know, having a, a larger audience, you know, uh, or maybe starting with smaller church groups would be so vital. It's getting out, it's getting it in the front of people's consciousness so they can even at first become aware and then they can move into action, but they can't do anything without being aware first. So um, is, are you intending on doing a circuit kind of run with this? So yeah, so we actually have a, a group, um, Pastor Blake Wilson, who's still on, and other two gentlemen is two. It just happens to be two uh, African-American pastors and two uh, Anglo-American pastors. And so back in October, um, us four, and I think, I don't have the exact number, but maybe 20 other pastors are in and around the city. We walk through that series together. In addition to that, leaders, about 200 leaders from various churches and uh, organizations came together a few times uh, to talk through this in detail. And so there is a plan, uh, some of it um, with COVID has kind of been, you know, affected how we did some of it. But yes, to answer your question, we've done that. We've started the conversation and we will continue. And I think what really helped us is that when you were able to see that this conversation was coming from a diverse group, because even though the four of us represent uh, two uh, ethnic groups, there are other people of other ethnic groups who are part of this conversation. And when we were having this conversation together, it really gave us permission to speak in places and with crowds that otherwise might not even pay attention to it. And, and, and how do I get on whatever list? Because I heard nothing of that. Mm you know, here in Fort Bend County. I don't know, Pastor Michelle, she's my uh, uh, pastor. Uh, maybe she did, I don't know, but um, I hadn't heard of it. Michelle, had you heard of this? Um, so I will take ownership that I have not heard it. What I will not say is that it was not sent to me. And so I have to, I, I don't know that I received it. Um, but that haven't been said moving forward. Yeah. Um, to, to get back to the, the, the question at hand, um, I would love to get direct contact information to follow up on what has been done and what we can do. Um, I have the gift of serving our Texas Annual Conference, which is about how many hundred churches as, as the missions um, uh, person, um, missions uh, chairperson. And I would love to move this conversation forward in our Texas Annual Conference. And so uh, Dr. Scott, I, if you could, uh, I'll give you my cell phone number or something because I'm, I'm ready to take this to our bishop and move it forward. Well, thank you for saying that. And if you don't mind, I, I'll drop in the chat. We have a Facebook page, um, Houston Area Pastors United We Stand, and all of the information about what we've done so far is on there and what we're going to do. If you get connected to that, um, you'll be in the loop. And uh, I definitely want to give you any resources you 
need to help with that conversation? Any other practical steps, Dr. Scott, for our churches that are engaging with our schools, whether it is through mentorship, through tutoring, um, maybe what's just something, and I know you're saying be empathetic, but maybe can you break that down a little bit more about just what that will look like practically for a church volunteer who may be serving food or helping families with job applications or something like that? Um, how could they be most healthy? Yeah, thank you for saying that. I, I do think that, you know, the broad statement of being empathetic does help, right? But specifically, if I'm serving in a school and I am aware, um, and, and by the way, let me say this to, to make sure we're on the same page. That there are, a person is dealing with a number of factors, right? So sure. um, systemic stuff is one of them. There's some stuff that may be dealing with at home. But when I'm aware of that, it may affect how I, how I counsel or, you um, you know, inform that person. I don't know the depth of relationships some people have with some of these students, but when you know that people of color have to deal with a certain type of thing, um, it, it, it helps the way that you inform that person. And there's an awareness that helps you, right? Um, with some of the step, steps, uh, not steps, but one of some of the studies, when you're talking about quantitative, qualitative studies that talks about how systemic issues affect us now, if I'm serving a school that has that demographic, then that I ought to want to be informed as to what are some of the things that person might experience um, so that it can help me as I mentor and walk with them, right? I'm not mm -hmm. saying for you to be, you know, a walking encyclopedia on all things related to race, right? Um, but but when you know, it does affect the way that you, you talk to that person. And, you know, when you think about the school that they're a part of, like, you know, I know some schools are Title I schools and they have additional funding and all that, but a lot of the schools in some of the, in these areas are going through a lot. And as a person who serves a school, I may say, you know what, because of some systemic stuff, maybe I can get my church on board to support in a greater way uh, this particular school. And so um, I think there are a number of ways that they could show up. But I think when you are informed, mm -hmm. right, it, it, it just changes your, your mentorship, your recommendation, how you fund, or uh, you know, mm -hmm. in that kind of way. And uh, I think the school prospers when we come alongside in that way. I love that. Thank you. All right. We have a couple of more minutes um, of discussion time. If there are any questions, any more questions or comments or scenarios, um, we can think through together on this topic. Um, all of our brains are here so we can put our heads together. Uh, Brittany, I'll say something. Sure. Um, you know, I know as church partnership, church school partnership leaders, we always want to know, okay, what do I do tomorrow? Like if my boots get on the ground, like what do I want to do? And so as I'm thinking through things that churches can do, um, sometimes just a personal story, honestly, uh, my daughter noticed that her school was not celebrating any history month. So not Black History Month, not Hispanic Heritage Month. And so she asked the question, um, why, why don't we have a bulletin board for these things? Why don't, you know, why don't we celebrate? Not in an aggressive way, but she just asked her administration why? Why is this not celebrated? And can I help celebrate that in some way? And so I think that's a really practical next step for churches to take is just be aware. Keep your head on the swivel on your campus. Notice if things are being celebrated and if they're not, offer help in starting that. Because honestly, let's, let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. It's probably that they didn't not want to celebrate that. It's just um, the bandwidth is small. And lots of times those things get pushed to the back burner. So that just may be a, a practical next step for uh, church leaders to take in their partnership. Yeah, that's, that's good. yeah, that's real good. Thank you. Real good example. My two um, personal experience, have, having seen certain church volunteers come into a, um, a school context that is doesn't look like them and just um, realizing that they they carry their own faulty worldviews their own perceptions and it shows in the way that they respond to the kids and the way that they think about why the kids act the way they do or why their parent does the way you know what that parent does so we realized we got to do our job in training our volunteers on some just basic cultural competency even. Um, and 
doing so to protect our church, but also to protect the students. Because um, the last thing we want to do is tarnish the witness of God by having a congregant say something insensitive. But it requires work, like, um, yeah, cultural competency training <laughs> for your congregants might not fly with your pastor. Um, but I think it's something that we can do tangibly to start sharing the stick. No, I said that wrong. Steering the ship <laughs> in the right direction. Um, but yeah. I think that's that's huge. Yeah, that's you good. Know, oh, go ahead. May, may I ask you? So I think you just said something really powerful. And at some point, some may need guidance and direction on how to to move forward. Then of this not being something that's supported by your church leadership. I, I think that is important that some of us receive this information and recognize that it is imperative that it be moved forward and we encounter roadblocks and obstacles and then we become daunted and overwhelmed and we just get stuck right and so it doesn't have to go through the channels of the church or the senior pastor so maybe that's something for us to talk about well, I was going to say, you know, one of the things that we saw while we were working through with the leaders is that some of the pastors who, like, for example, started the series on race at church, got a lot of pushback, right? Because especially in this season, y'all know, let's be honest, you know, everything is so polarized and mm -hmm. it was, we were doing this in October, November is around the corner. So, you know, and so sometimes that is not the most effective way. I think leaders need to know and pray through the right way to approach this conversation because we have a responsibility as local church leaders. Um, but all of us are equipped, all of us are disciples, all of us, you know, have, you know, can do something. And so there may need to be a, another space to, to dig in this conversation because it's a hard conversation, right? People scream and slam doors and walk out of the room and it's hard. But if we, if we can love each other through the conversation, slam a door, come back, apologize, pray together, eat together, do it, you know what I mean? that's how we grow. And sometimes that doesn't always happen, uh, quote unquote, top down. It, it happens organically with people in the pew. Mm -hmm. Amen. If I could just add mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Dr. Scott just touched on the power of proximity, which is something RSAP was talking about yesterday. It's absolutely foundational if we're going to help our congregants cross barriers. Um, and I think one, maybe one practical way is to get your pastor more involved in your church school partnership. I think oftentimes we see lay leaders or other staff members taking the charge, but it's so powerful when the pastor can get involved in the church school partnership and begin to be more proximate to people who may look different or think differently than they do. And of course, it depends on which school you're partnered with. Like I know, Pastor Michelle, I know y'all are partnered in, um, yeah, a very diverse area. Uh, I don't know if it'd be possible to get your pastor more involved, but that's an idea as well. That way they begin to see and pick up on things on their own. Yeah, that's very helpful. We have one more question in the chat. Is, is there a specific training that will be recommended for mentors in schools from a church? I looked at a large anti-racism resource page and about bridges out of poverty, but um, wondered a recommendation. So there are some great resources. Um, and honestly, and this is anecdotal, but based on my experience, it's it's really good to get an idea of where the church is and then make recommendation. Because I've made recommendations on, like I have five books I would give everybody. And folks weren't ready for those five. And so I had to adjust my recommendation. Be a Bridge is a good book that most churches are willing to, to, to jump into. Uh, so I would recommend that to almost everyone. Um, but then depending on uh, where to go after that, um, it, it depends on the conversation, but start with be a bridge. Um, I think that'll help. And then I can make recommendations if I talk to you offline. Sounds good. They said, thank you. Um, I also want to say that this is going to be recorded and we're going to send this out. 
So even if this is the first step, um, them being able to, to hear what Dr. Scott presented at first and even hear our conversations, um, that could be helpful for you to share along with other volunteers that are working in the schools. And then also inviting them to our leaders gatherings. Like we're gonna continue uh, talking through our continuum of relief, reconciliation and development. So we'll have more speakers uh, ne next month, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk on community development, but this reconciliation conversation is going to come up again. So we're hoping that you guys track along with us as we're having these conversations. And you can invite whomever from, from your team. Your whole team is always uh, welcome to participate as well. Um, they are asking for those five books. Can you just put them in the chat? And Let me pull up my list right now. Okay. Well, this was awesome, y'all. Thank you guys so, so much for being um, so willing to participate. As Dr. Scott said, this is a tough conversation. Um, it's not easy to have. It's not easy for, for some of us to even listen to. And so um, I appreciate you guys just being present and, and just hanging in there and just prayerfully to God will uh, massage all of our heart, hearts so that we um, can internalize like what his will is in this regard for us.